In autumn 2018, a Chinese blogger who claimed to be a veteran in China's financial sector sent shockwaves through the business community with an article saying that the historic mission of private enterprise had achieved all of its goals in China and that communist ideology would be coming back in full force. The era of private enterprise was over. The article was so widely shared and caused such consternation that the Communist Party spoke out to calm the nerves of the business community. There was nothing for people to worry about. Shortly afterwards, though, the crackdowns began. Over the last few years, President Xi's administration launched a series of campaigns targeting different areas of business with the goal of reshaping the business and cultural landscape in China. The government targeted the fintech industry, private tuition and entertainment, as well as perceived societal ills such as celebrity culture, gaming and effeminate fashion trends. They also banned the beloved children's animated character Winnie the Pooh. I don't know, maybe you're not supposed to say Pooh. I mean, honestly, who named that bear? This just doesn't seem a place for a bear. The severity of the action taken by Beijing against private companies surprised people both in China and abroad. And while these attacks on private enterprise were harming the economy, the real damage was yet to come. The three red line policy in August 2020 essentially sucked all of the air out of the room for China's property developers. This was a big deal as China's property sector is estimated to make up almost a third of the country's total economic output. A number of developers unable to refinance, including Evergrande, Kaiser Group, Fantasia Holdings and Modern Land China, have since defaulted on their debt and the property market has ground to a halt over the last few months. The problem is bigger than that though, as local governments in China historically raised about a third of their total revenues from selling land leases to property developers. That revenue source evaporated in autumn 2021. Now, just to be clear, there was a definite problem of excessive leverage and real estate malinvestment in China, and this had been building for 15 to 20 years. My friend Hugh Hendry has pointed out that there are 55 million empty housing units in China right now and 93 million new homes under construction. Actual housing demand is estimated to be 7 million new units per year. That's a lot of excess inventory building up. Something did have to be done about the excesses in the real estate sector, but you have to question if the brakes had to be slammed on that hard and if it makes sense to hammer other sectors of the economy at the same time. The government actions erased billions of dollars of value for both domestic and foreign investors. It put unprecedented levels of pressure on some of the country's largest employers, local governments and corporate contributors to economic growth. The crackdowns left investors and Chinese business people wondering if it made any sense to invest in China at all going forward. So why did this have to happen right now? Well, Chinese officials insist that all is going to plan. In April 2021, the party's Politburo said China's strong rebound from the pandemic had presented a window of opportunity to tackle critical structural challenges in the country. They note that the Chinese economy is on track to exceed the government's full-year growth target of more than 6%. They argue that this crackdown is a necessary element of a larger campaign to eliminate financial risks that could blow up if not addressed immediately, and that these steps are needed to eradicate inequality and bring about common prosperity. There is something to be said for some of these arguments. Housing affordability in China is right now amongst the worst in the world. It takes 40 years of income in Shenzhen to purchase an apartment. That compares to 13 years in London and 8 in New York, cities that are not famed for their affordability. President Xi has famously said that housing is for living in and not speculation, and he considers housing policy as the central part of his common prosperity drive. China's trade surplus reached its highest level on record in 2021. It was 26% higher than the prior year, and exports were 30% higher. 
China's manufacturing industry benefited from a shift around the world from people spending money on services to buying tangible goods over the course of the pandemic. There was a sudden drop in Chinese exports in early 2020 at the start of the pandemic, but Chinese exports of goods quickly took off once domestic cases of the virus fell and lockdowns were imposed in other countries around the world. It doesn't make sense to kick the can down the road as prior administrations have done in China, and it possibly makes sense to implement reforms at a time when the rest of the economy is experiencing growth. But it's not clear that a lot of planning went into implementing the Three Red Lines policy. It would appear that the Chinese government were entirely unprepared for the repercussions. Since Xi has taken power, two big policy mantras have been put forth by Beijing, common prosperity and dual circulation. Each is likely to be further emphasized over time. Common prosperity signifies an intent to raise the living standards of the approximately 600 million Chinese have-nots, while dual circulation entails a shift towards greater self-reliance, avoiding importing goods from abroad and attempt to achieve greater localization of China's supply chain. In an online speech to the World Economic Forum's annual meeting, President Xi struck a pro-growth tone in his defense of the common prosperity policy. He said, the common prosperity we desire is not egalitarianism. We will first make the pie bigger and then divide it properly through reasonable institutional arrangements. As a rising tide lifts all boats, everyone will get a fair share from development and development gains will benefit all of our people in a more substantial and equitable way. It doesn't appear that many of the recent campaigns have done much to grow the pie, as he described, and I struggle to imagine how any of them would, and we'll have to wait and see how the more equal division goes. So China is still growing, but it's growing less than before. By most international standards, China's 4% year-on-year growth in the fourth quarter of last year was a great performance. But while it was above most analysts' predictions, it was the slowest pace of expansion for 18 months, a slide from 6.5% growth during the same period in 2020. This raises the question, as Xi seeks a third term later this year, if the economic consequences of his common prosperity campaign are beginning to spiral out of control. The three main factors putting a drag on the Chinese economy right now are, number one, the crackdowns on businesses like in the tech sector and education sector, number two, the collapse of the property market, and number three, China's zero COVID strategy, which goes far beyond social distancing and wearing masks. It involves people being confined to their homes, closed roads, suspended transportation services, and it's left citizens short of food and other essential supplies. It's almost as bad as Canada. China appears to be taking this action partly to prevent disruption to the upcoming Winter Olympics, trading economic growth for international prestige. China's slowdown is, to a certain extent, self-inflicted, but it doesn't look like Beijing will relax any of the policies affecting these three key areas, as they appear to reflect a strongly held official conviction. On top of these problems, Chinese companies are facing a number of additional headwinds. US tariffs are still in place, and there are new investment blacklists relating to human rights abuses. So what's happening on the ground in China due to these policy-led slowdowns? Well, in December, China's state council accused the local government in Bajau of violating government orders by going on a fee collection spree from small and medium-sized businesses to make up for its declining land sale and tax revenues from the property slowdown. The local government ordered officials to collect $47 million in new revenues through the imposition of arbitrary fees and fines on the local business community. A factory owner describes being forced by the local meteorological office to buy an expensive lightning rod from a government-designated supplier at a highly inflated price. 
The central government, while outraged, said nothing about their own policies that had forced the municipality to scramble for revenues in this manner. Local party and government officials in China are complaining that they, not the central government in Beijing, have to foot the increasingly expensive bill for Evergrande's collapse. As I mentioned in a prior piece, they're being asked to complete Evergrande projects that buyers have already paid for, but they don't appear to be receiving any government funds to get this done. An executive at a construction firm told the press that his firm is refusing to do any work on Evergrande projects for the local government unless he's paid in advance. He's already owed money for work he did on Evergrande. In other cities, local officials are trying to auction their Evergrande problems away by selling off the developers' uncompleted projects in their jurisdictions. There are news reports of Chinese people who've seen their home prices half offering to give away their partially paid off homes to anyone who'll take over the remaining mortgage payments. There are other problems cropping up too. In China, developers often force their suppliers to accept commercial paper, a form of IOU, instead of cash payments. They promise to pay this off by a future date. The supplier is then able to use this commercial paper to pay its suppliers, provided it endorses the document by stamping a company chop or seal on the back of it. This commercial paper can easily be endorsed 10 times before it ends up with the final holder. If a company like Evergrande is unable to pay upon maturity, the holder can sue every company that endorsed the document, potentially freezing assets worth many times more than the original debt. This is a big problem right now. In 2020, the total amount of commercial paper issued by Chinese companies came to 3.5% of Chinese GDP. Evergrande alone accounted for more than 60% of commercial paper issuance by the top 20 real estate developers. So is the government doing anything to ease these problems? Well, so far they're not doing much. China lowered its one-year loan prime rate by 10 basis points, and the five-year rate, which is used to price mortgages, was reduced by five basis points, the first cut since April 2020. The party's year-end economic planning conference reiterated that the government would continue to refrain from flood-like stimulus and would continue its battles against the disorderly expansion of capital. Uh, That's party speak for the various crackdowns on private sector businesses, as well as speculation and high leverage in the real estate industry. What about the mostly state-controlled Chinese banks? Well, Chinese banks rushed to meet their state-required lending quotas last month by buying up low-risk financial instruments rather than by issuing loans. They bought bankers' acceptance bills, which are technically classified as loans, and yield close to 0%. Chinese banks have a cost of capital of around 2.5%. This means that they prefer to lose money on low-yielding bankers' acceptance bills rather than risking greater losses by issuing their own loans at higher rates of interest. Many of the problems being faced by President Xi were in place when he took office. But it could be argued that better planning was needed in order for these problems to be unwound in an orderly manner. Before implementing the three red lines policy that would force Chinese developers to deleverage, the government could have made plans for funding local governments that were reliant on selling land leases to developers to fund their operations. A lack of planning can also be seen in the growing contagion that's happening in Chinese commercial paper markets. It would appear that under these policies, Chinese property prices will be in structural decline and local governments will have to deal with tight finances for the foreseeable future. The technology, education and entertainment industries in China will also have to deal with growing regulations. For several years, China has contributed more to global GDP growth than any other country. And before the coronavirus pandemic struck, it often accounted for close to one third of the world's economic growth. 
Last year, China contributed about one quarter of global GDP growth as its property sector collapsed, birth rates declined and debt levels rose. These headwinds are unlikely to dissipate anytime soon. If you enjoyed this video, you should watch this one next. See you again soon. Bye.